Melissa, how'd you go in the Army? Um, I joined the Army. It's pretty, uh, pretty straight and simple. I, I love our country. I learned from a young age what it meant to wear the uniform, to be a soldier, and if you asked I wanted to be when I grew up, it was always I wanted to be in the military. Did you go in before or after 9-11? After 9-11. So I was in ROTC at the time at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, September 11th happened, and I was a senior in college, and it was, we were told then it was more a matter, it wasn't a matter of if we were going to be deployed, it was more a matter of when. So it really kind of became real at that point. What about the gender issue when you first went in? I mean, we were making the transition yet at that point to women, especially women serving downrange in combat conditions. Was it difficult? As a female, was it difficult? Um, no. Um, you know, I get that. I actually get that question quite a bit. Was it difficult to be a female in the military? And I was in a service support unit. I was transportation corps, um, in charge of a whole bunch of vehicles. And in my mind, we all wore the same uniform. I never got treated as, as any, any different as anybody else in, in the same uniform. Let's go back to that April day okay. in 2004, because I have found that it's not only instructive, it's cathartic, and we ought not to be afraid to ask about these Absolutely. Ask away. episodes. Tell me how the day began. Um, so it was April 13th, 2004. Um, I was on a routine convoy through central Baghdad. The only difference was that day I was in, um, I was in a vehicle. I was in a Humvee. Uh, I had, typically I would sit in the passenger seat. This specific day I was directly behind the driver. Um, we had no doors, no armor. And about 10 minutes into the, into the ride, um, big boom, big blast goes off. And uh, what you see today is um, that was the last day I ever stood on, on my own two legs. And the result of the blast of the IED and kind of the ricocheting off of a guard rear resulted in the loss of my left leg above the knee. How do they treat you right away in the field? Um, you know, lucky for me, and it's, in any convoy that we were in, there was a combat medic in my convoy. There were two vehicles back. He ran over, pulled me up by my flak vest, got an IV started. Um, they didn't tell me my leg was gone. I found that out later. They called for a medevac. I was flown to the emergency hospital in central Baghdad, rushed into an emergency surgery, um, was reassured that I was in an American hospital, and I woke up and woke up without my leg. And what did you think when you realized you'd lost your life? Uh, you know, it sounds so cheesy and so, um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I've always been a very positive person. Whether it was a medication or the pain or whatever it was, I, I remember thinking and just knowing that it, everything was going to, that it, it was okay. And I was glad it was myself and not another one of my soldiers. Um, I knew I had an incredibly strong support system and just that um, I'd be able to get through it. So... I kind of just wanted to do that. I wanted to start the process, the healing process of getting through it. So you get transferred from uh, Baghdad to Germany. I, yes. I want to take everyone through the yep. odyssey that everybody goes through. How long were you in Germany? I was in Germany and launched in Germany for about five days. So they kind of stabilized. They, I was stabilized before making a long trip back to Walter Reed. Get back to Walter Reed. You get fitted with this prosthetic. Yes. And the good news and the bad news, you and I talked about this backstage. The bad news, obviously, is we have too many young people losing a limb. The good news is that we've learned a lot about how they can be replaced with these artificial devices. Right. Is this the latest model, and is it profoundly different than what you got the first time you got fitted for a prosthetic? Um, so, yes, this is the latest model. Um, I can talk a little bit about what it does in a little bit. But I mean, at Walter Reed, the, the good thing about being at Walter Reed and being a wounded veteran is we get the best prosthetic. So when I first got to Walter Reed, the prosthetic that I got was the latest and greatest model that was out there. And it was able to, I was able to stand up, I was able to walk, and I was able to, to do pretty well early on. And I think kind of in the American public, there's these two perceptions. You have this one perception where, you know, someone sees me walking down the street and they say, oh, my gosh, look at her, poor her, you know, her life must be so horrible. And they think that I go home and I sit into a dark room and I, and I cry. But what they don't know is that I wake up the next day, I put on my leg, and I had, that I do more in my life that I would have ever done with two legs. But I have my prosthetic leg and my life is more fulfilled. And that day on April 13, 2004, it changed my life for the better. So that's one perception. And then you have another perception where a lot of us may have seen the Olympics or the Paralympic Games. You have Oscar Pistorius with the missing both of his legs below the knee, and they claim that, that those prosthetics gave him an unfair advantage. So that's another <laughs> perception where someone looks at me and they think, oh, my gosh, that's a robot leg. They, it's gonna, it helps her walk. It goes home. It cooks for dinner. It pumps her gas. <laughs> and that's not really the case. So that's one perception where I put the leg on, and sure, I can do everything I want to do, but I have to actually work at it. So the correct perception is actually somewhere in the middle, but you kind of, you know, thanks to the media, you have the heartbreaking stories, you have the wonderful stories, and the reality is really somewhere in the middle. Well, we're here to talk about the reality. Okay. Were you a good athlete before you had the uh, injury in Iraq? 
Uh, I like to think I was. I don't know. I, um, I, was an, I, I wanted to be an Olympic gymnast when I was younger. So I always thought of myself as being athletic, but um, never really to where I am today. And you chose to be a swimmer. Yes. Yes. Um, it, it was easy to get into the pool. I didn't have to wear a prosthetic leg. I could use my crutches and kind of get in. So I started out there. And what about the people who are participating in, in the Paralympics with you and how you communicate with each other? I mean, you're very competitive, obviously. Right. But is there a different kind of bond as a result of the experience that you're going through? Absolutely. I mean, you take any, anyone in the Paralympic Games. I mean, if any of you saw um, online the, the broadcast of the London Paralympic Games, you take any one of them, and they all have such inspiring stories. And each one of them have gone through a, such an incredible obstacle, and they've overcome it. And they've been able to make themselves better. And you kind of bond over that, knowing that you've overcome such a hard obstacle to be where you are and on the biggest athletic stage that you can be. And, and Melissa, share with this audience what it's like to be ha having been wounded in Iraq, having the prosthetic, having improved your life, as you say, and how they should respond to other wounded warriors that they see in airports and shopping centers on Saturday mornings at the soccer field. What is it they should know about them and how they can approach them and talk about them? Um, I mean, I think you treat them just like you would treat anybody else. We all just want to fit in. We want to be part of reality. We want to come back and be reintegrated back into our life. And we don't want to be treated any differently. If I, if I get to, if, I, if you start talking about something I don't want to talk about, I'll let you know. Or if you ask me a question that I don't want to answer, I just won't answer it. And you just kind of treat them just as you would treat anybody else. Do you have a job? I do. What do you do? I work in the field of prosthetic, so I fit other amputees with artificial limbs. And are you treating a lot of veterans, or are you treating civilians who are losing their legs in automobile accidents or bicycle accidents or whatever? Um, a, a big variety. So you have a, definitely some veterans from this generation and past and uh, past wars, and then those that were born without limbs, those that lost due to trauma, disease, and really kind of the whole, the whole gamut. So when you talk about your work in the prosthetic center, is that one more demonstration of how your life is better than it would have been if you would not lost your own life? Absolutely. I didn't even know the field of prosthetics existed. When they said I was going to get my leg from a certified prosthetist, I said, from what? <laughs> like, it's, just, it's just kind of an unknown field unless you need it or you know somebody. It's kind of um, unknown. So absolutely, it's changed my life. How about your family? How do they react to it all? Um, you know, I was the, the youngest daughter. Um, you know, they, when I first joined the military, my dad legitimately asked the question if they allow girls in the military. So it was very unknown. So it's kind of a big wake-up call, but I loved it. In turn, they loved it. Um, a lot of times, it was me reassuring them that you know life is okay and that I'll be okay. And I think we kind of grew together, we thrived together, and um, I like to think that they're proud parents. I think I can say on behalf of all of us, not just that it is okay, and we're all very privileged to know you and to have you share your story with us. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you.